How did you like your dinner, Allegra? It was really good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, for our main dish, we got salads. Yeah, French salads. Yes, French salads. It was a French cafe. It was pretty good. Like, the dressing was good. It wasn't French dressing, though. No, it was not. Well... I mean, technically it was French dressing, <laughs> yeah. but not like the French dressing you see like in America or even if you even see it anymore. I never see it anywhere. Yeah, I've never been to a restaurant and had French dressing. And I would have thought that of all places, the French restaurant would be the one. Yeah, no, I don't think it's I, I think French dressing in France is a lot different than French dressing here. <laughs> yeah. But now that you mention it, you don't see French dressing at like those salad places in New York like just salad or sweet green or chopped. Yeah, all those like salad boutique places. Yeah, they don't have anything called French dressing. Or even anything really like French dressing. Yeah, that's weird. Like what? <laughs> Is that, it's not cool right now? I don't know. I feel like maybe French dressing will, will be cool soon, but um, I haven't had it in a while. When was the last time you had it? I don't, I honestly don't remember at all. Yeah, I'm going to go find that out. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and then we're both here with the salad. That's it. What is happy to salad? Uh, what is happy to salad that never happened before? What is happening to salads? Or specifically, salad dressings. Or even more specifically, French dressing. French salad dressing. That sweet, smooth flavor. Your family's favorite barbecue sauce. On this episode of Ah, Would You Look at the Time, my colleague Andrew and I find out what government operatives may be doing to restrict French dressing innovation. Make something happen to salad that never happened before. All right, here we go. What? French dressing is federally regulated? Yeah. yeah. Craft French. Lively, but never too sharp or spicy. No, wait a minute. You can't call it French dressing. You've got to call it an imitation French dressing. Ah. It's hurt us quite a bit, I'm sure. <laughs> the Book of Salads may have the clue. Ah. Make something happen to salads that never happened before. Well, we've wandered into another rabbit hole, <laughs> this time about French dressing. Yes. Obviously, the first thing I did when I looked up French dressing was go on the Wikipedia page. And, you know, it says here, French dressing in American cooking is a creamy ketchup-based dressing which varies in color from pale orange to bright red. It can be made by blending olive oil, vinegar, tomato paste, ketchup, brown sugar, paprika, and salt. It's sunny and bright, big and friendly. It's craft French dressing with a creamy natural flavor big enough to bask in. Craft French, one of the salad wonders of the world. You've seen this a lot in stores. Yeah, it's the reddish kind of orangey salad dressing and it's always in the grocery store and I never ever get it or think about getting it. Yeah, but here's the thing. The thing that I found on this Wikipedia page, the thing that made me drop everything and spend the next foreseeable future indulging myself in. This next sentence in the Wikipedia page. In the United States, French dressing is regulated by federal standards. The Association for Dressings and Sauces is lobbying to remove this regulation. There's stuff that means a lot to me here. <laughs> French dressing is regulated by federal standards. Mm -hmm. And the Association for Dressings and Sauces is lobbying to remove this regulation. <laughs> I was like, okay, the Association for Dressings and Sauces. All right, here we go. Let me put my coat on. Yeah, literally, I feel like I was there when you were discovering a lot of this mm -hmm. because we were hanging out and I was just sitting on your couch playing Mario Kart while you spent hours just looking up French dressing facts and the association and everything for like the entire night. Yeah. And then after that, of course, now I'm involved in this whole world of dressings and sauces with you. Yep. So what did we find out about this regulation? 
Well, in Title 21 of the Code of Federal Regulations, which is reserved for the rules of the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, Chapter 1, Subchapter B, Part 169, Subpart B, Section 169.115, French Dressing. A. Description. French dressing is a separable liquid food or the emulsified viscous fluid food prepared from vegetable oil and one or both of the acidifying ingredients specified in paragraph B of this section. One or more of the ingredients specified in paragraph C of this section may also be used. The vegetable oil may be used to contain an optional crystallization inhibitor as specified in paragraph C11 of this section. All the ingredients from which the food is fabricated shall be safe and suitable. French dressing contains not less than 35% by weight of vegetable oil. French dressing may be mixed and packed in an atmosphere in which the air is replaced in whole or in part by carbon dioxide or nitrogen. B. Acidifying ingredients. 1. Any vinegar or any vinegar diluted with water, or any such vinegar or diluted vinegar mixed with an optional acidifying ingredient as specified in paragraph C9 of this section. For the purpose of this paragraph, any blend of two or more vinegars is considered to be a vinegar. 2. Lemon juice and or lime juice in any appropriate form, which may be diluted with water. C. Other optional ingredients. The following optional ingredients may also be used. 1. Salt. 2. Nutritive carbohydrate sweeteners. 3. Spices and or natural flavorings. 4. Monosodium glutamate. 5. Tomato paste, tomato puree, ketchup, sherry wine. 6. Eggs and ingredients derived from eggs. 7. Color additives that will impart the color traditionally expected. 8. Stabilizers and thickeners to which calcium carbonate or sodium hexametophosphate may be added. Dioctyl sodium sulfosusinate may be added in accordance with section 172.810 of this chapter. 9. Citric or malic acid in the amount not greater than 25% of the weight of acids of the vinegar or diluted vinegar calculated as acetic acid. 10. Sequestrants including but not limited to calcium disodium EDTA and or disodium ETDA may be used to preserve color and or flavor. 11. Crystallization inhibitors including but not limited to oxystearin, lecithin, or polyglycerol esters of fatty acids. D. Nomenclature. The name of the food is French dressing. E. Label declaration. Each of the ingredients used in the food shall be declared on the label as required by applicable sections of parts 101 and 130 of this chapter. Thank you for reading all of that and not making me read any of it. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, okay, so obviously it's not weird that there's a regulation for salad dressing, right? That's the reason why the FDA exists. Yeah. Uh, but here's a couple weird things about this regulation for French dressing. One, this is the only specific salad dressing that's regulated. There's no federal regulation for like – Caesar dressing or Italian dressing or Thousand Island or things like that. It's just French dressing. And then the next section goes right to just salad dressing overall. Yeah, that's key to remember for later. Yeah. And two, I feel like what the FDA says makes a dressing a French dressing is really vague. And basically all the in defining ingredients of French dressing are deemed optional here. Like, a lot of dressings can fit under this category. And as long as it meets the standards, it's just – it could be French dressing. Yeah. And that just gave me more questions. Like, why does the Association for Dressings and Sauces – want to remove this regulation? I mean, what even is the Association for Dressings and Sauces? It sounds like something I would want to be in. Mm -hmm. Well, according to their website, the Association for Dressings and Sauces, or the ADS, quote, was founded in 1926 and represents manufacturers of salad dressing, mayonnaise, and condiment sauces and suppliers of raw materials, packaging, and equipment to this segment of the food industry. So they're like a group of people in the sauce and dressing business who can like collectively advocate for their industry. Yep. Well, we sure as heck had to ask them about their stance on this French dressing matter. Yes, but they declined an interview with us. Yes, but they did send us a statement. I hired someone on Fiverr to read that for us. The Association for Dressings and Sauces would like to see the French dressing standard of identity repealed. In 1998... ADS submitted a citizen petition to the FDA requesting, in part, that the French dressing standard of identity be repealed. Since the standard was adopted, there has been a proliferation of a wide variety of non-standardized pourable salad dressings with different flavors, such as Italian, blue cheese, vinaigrette, ranch, Caesar, and composition, including reduced fat, 
light, and fat-free dressings. The French dressing standard does not serve as a benchmark for these pourable salad dressings due to the variation in composition to meet specific consumer tastes. As a result, the French dressing standard has been marginalized and simply restricts innovation, leading to the use of alternative nomenclature to identify the product rather than considering amending the standard. The repeal of the French dressing standard would promote honesty and fair dealing in the interest of consumers. So I think what the ADS is basically saying is that without regulation on French dressing, companies can create newer and more innovative dressings and not worry about being restricted by federal law. Yeah, uh, this is a common reason for deregulating things in general in the U.S. The Trump-appointed FDA commissioner, Scott Gottlieb, had a lot of deregulation on his agenda. Uh, There's even a movement for deregulating frozen cherry pie. Mm -hmm. But that statement still doesn't really provide any reasoning for why French dressing was regulated in the first place. So we figured the best way to find that out was to just ask the FDA. Yeah, getting it straight from the horse's mouth, baby. So we emailed the FDA for an interview. Which they did not grant. But they did send us a statement. The FDA began establishing standards of identity to promote honesty and fair dealing in the interest of consumers shortly after the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, FD&C Act, was enacted in 1938. Among them is the standard of identity for French dressing, which we proposed in the Federal Register of November 5, 1949, 14 FR 6709 at 6720, further explained in the Federal Register of August 12, 1950. 15 FR 5219 at 5227, and published in the Federal Register of December 20, 1955, 20 FR 9525 at 9601. In the 1949 Federal Register notice, FDA stated that, quote, dressings for salads constitute a class of foods the members of which characteristically contain a fat ingredient, an acidifying ingredient, and seasoning ingredients. Three members of this class of foods, commonly known as mayonnaise, French dressing, and salad dressing, are distributed commercially in large quantities as ready-prepared dressings, unquote. The 1949 Federal Register Notice and the others mentioned above also explain more about the specific requirements. I also hired someone on Fiverr to read that for us. Again, there's not much info here in the explanation behind why French dressing was regulated specifically. But one thing we do know here is when the FDA first petitioned to regulate French dressing. 1949. Yeah. Through 12 months dark with conflict, 1949, like all years, leaves its message for posterity. Well, it turns out that year didn't help us as much as I thought. French dressing was well established as a dressing by this year. And there were other kinds of salad dressings, too. Like this was not a new product at the time. And the Federal Register that the FDA mentioned it still categorizes everything into French dressing, salad dressing, and mayonnaise. So we had to go back a little bit further. Right, which means we went back to the beginning of French dressing. Yes. And it turns out it was actually the first kind of salad dressing available in stores nationwide. It was sold by Kraft in the 20s. <laughs> But Kraft got into the salad dressing business by buying a company called Milani in 1925. They made their own dressing called French dressing. You can still buy Milani dressing today. I found an ad for it here in the Chicago Tribune in 1925. What is more appetizing or even more healthful than a salad for lunch? It would be hard to choose a more suitable summer dish than a salad with Milani's French dressing. Milani's, you know, is that wonderful French dressing so many have tried to imitate. So be sure to look for the name to make sure you get the genuine. So that nomenclature was around before Kraft used it. But anyway, the real turning point here for us was when we found this really old book called The Edgewater Beach Hotel Salad Book, a.k.a. A Book of Salads. A Book of Salads, which is such a good title, and it's such a weird, good book, too. Yeah, I found out about this book from this great food history site, foodtimeline.org. I was looking at, like, the earliest published recipes for this, like, American-style French dressing. I ended up finding that book on eBay, and I bought it. The Book of Salads is this, like, heavy, mystical-looking book 
Uh, it says it was published in 1926. It's like dark green and, and it looks like it's from Harry Potter. It's 265 pages worth of salad and salad dressing recipes. And in the salad dressing section, there are 10 pages dedicated to just French dressing. Yes, 10 pages of French dressing recipes. But why? Yeah, well, on the first page of the section, there's a list of five, quote unquote, bases that make a variety of different kinds of French dressings, like a lemon color base, pink color base, orange color base. Right. And then there's like a bunch of recipes for the next nine pages that start with those different bases. So there's an Italian dressing recipe under the French dressing section and a Norwegian dressing recipe under the French dressing section, and a potato dressing recipe under the French dressing section. Yeah, so we realized that French dressing served as a base for all these different kinds of vinaigrette dressings. Right. That's the word here. The key word is vinaigrette. Yeah, and that word, as you would assume, is French. <laughs> yes, which is when we knew that we were on to something here. Yeah. And from there, we looked up the history of vinaigrette. And uh, as you can imagine further, vinaigrette, commonly known as French dressing in the 19th century America. Yes. So that means French dressing was a blanket term for multiple kinds of salad dressing. So that's what I think the FDA means when they're referring to French dressing in the regulation. It categorizes it in the same way the Book of Salads does, as like a vinaigrette. Yeah, so just like regular dressing. <laughs> yeah. But remember that other salad dressing regulation in Title 21. What does that regulation refer to then? <laughs> but OK, so we had to go back to Title 21 of the Code of Federal Regulations, and we saw that the FDA described salad dressing as, quote, an emulsified semi-solid food. And if you look at the description in the French dressing section, which I read earlier, it describes French dressing as a liquid food. Solid versus liquid. Those are the key words here, because that is the main difference. So because there's both liquid and solid dressings, there needed to be two separate regulations. And the Association for Dressings and Sauces went on to confirm this for us. In addition to the many new product introductions seen in the pourable dressings category, the 1950s also saw the adoption of the first federal standards of identity to set minimums for critical ingredients for mayonnaise, spoonable salad dressing, and French pourable dressing. Spoonable versus pourable. Spoonable versus pourable. Ugh. So like the 1950s, when this is uh, being regulated, also the dawn of consumerist culture in the United States, I might add, you can imagine there's a wide variety of salad dressings becoming available. Homemade potato salad. The newest potato magic from Betty Crocker. I think you could get most women to agree that a jello salad makes the meal. Why do salads taste so much better with Best Foods Real Mayonnaise? Because of Best Foods Superb Ingredients. Ordinary starchy dressings just can't compare. Miracle Whip was huge then. That's considered a dressing. Tomorrow, pick up a jar of America's best-liked salad dressing, Miracle Whip, created for you by Kraft. And then there's just the classic French-style vinaigrette-based dressings. In New Orleans' old French Quarter, they made great Creole sauce with peppers, garlic, onions, tomatoes, red wine. Now, Seven Seas turns it into a salad dressing. New Seven Seas Creole French, a spicy, tangy dressing that takes your taste where it's never been before, tingling with spices, mellowed with wine. Creole French from Seven Seas, the dressings that take your taste where it's never been before. Yep, the 50s was when French dressing was like what we think of as salad dressing now. So basically anything with an oil and vinegar base. And that's why it needed to be distinguished from spoonable salad dressing that was like thick and goopy, like jello fruit salad things. Yeah. The Book of Salads has a whole section actually on like mayo based and sour cream based dressings. But today, basically all salad dressings are pourable dressings. And I guess the idea of spoonable dressings kind of died off. I can't remember the last time I spooned a dressing on something. <laughs> yeah. Ew. So if you're confused, the ADS proved their point for sure. These regulations are outdated, and that's their argument for why French dressing should be deregulated. So what does the FDA think about the ADS's argument here? 
We asked them, and it turns out that they're on the same page as the ADS, and even they're confused by these old regulations and definitions. And they gave us a statement. The FDA is proposing to amend our standard of identity regulations to remove the standard of identity requirements at 21 CFR 169.115 for the manufacture of French dressing products. This action, if finalized, would provide food manufacturers with greater flexibility in the production of French dressing products. But when is this deregulation going to happen? If everyone's on board, why is this, when is this happening? According to the FDA, they are, quote, aiming to publish proposed rules to revoke the standards of identity for frozen cherry pie and for French dressing in 2019. 2019, that's, that's, that's now. this year. That's, that's now. right now. But it's also, right now, it's October. It's like almost mid-October. So for when specifically this is going to actually happen, who knows? Yeah, they were like, quote, the timelines are for long-range internal planning purposes only. And generally speaking, it is not uncommon for these release dates of information and rulemaking announcements to shift for a variety of reasons. Well, at least they're working on it. A little bit of breaking news right now. FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb is resigning after two years in the role. Gottlieb has waged a pitched battle against teen smoking and vaping. The one thing I do wonder about this was like, how much does this actually affect business owners who make French dressing? Are they struggling because of this regulation? So we found this one salad dressing company called Mullins that makes French dressing. But what was super interesting to us is that not only do they make French dressing, but they also make something called imitation French dressing. And on the website, there's actually an explanation of the difference between the two and why they have those two. Yeah, it says uh, on their product for imitation French dressing. For many decades, J.D. Mullen marketed this delicious dressing Americans loved, no matter what it was called. In order to meet state and federal law requirements, we chose to change the name rather than add more oil to the original recipe. So apparently their original French dressing did not meet the French dressing requirements in the FDA regulations. So they had to name it imitation French dressing. Yeah. And then they had to make a different French dressing that actually kept up with the regulations. So Lager, you reached out for an interview. Uh, yes. And they actually gave us one. Yes. Finally, we got someone to talk to. Someone. We talked to Jeff Shaner, who owns Mullins Salad Dressing. Yeah. Just as well get her started. All right. Uh, so can you tell us when, like, when Mullen started and how it came to be? Well, I can give you the whole background if you like. Uh, John Mullen, he ran away from home when he was in his teenage years and ended up out in Nebraska, I believe. And out there he uh, just happened to hook up with a uh, German chef. And this chef taught him to cook and for in place so he could have some place to stay. And so he learned how to cook and became a pretty good cook. And then about the time World War One came along, uh, he got drafted into the Army. And so he was uh, stationed over in France. And since he was a cook, then naturally the uh, Army made him an MP uh, in their wisdom. And so anyway, he noticed over there, even during war times, that there was a, a pretty good uh, following there at, at one restaurant. So he got to hanging out around it and uh, come to find out that uh, the thing that the, uh, really drew the customers in was, was a French sauce. And so he hung around there for a little while and kind of learned some of the, the secrets. And the chef told him over there that said, uh, well, if, if you're any kind of cook, you can go back and figure it out for yourself how to do it. <laughs> so after he got discharged from the Army, then he came back over and, uh, to the States and started doing just that. He would uh, he worked on some railroad dining cars, uh, traveling across country, and then he uh, would work at some restaurants, and he finally got to a place where he would buy a restaurant that wasn't doing too well, and then uh, using his sauce and some other uh, things that he knew, he would turn the restaurant restaurant around and, and uh, sell it. So he had uh, a succession of uh, several restaurants that he did this with. Uh, he finally ended up in uh, Robinson, Illinois, which is about seven miles from here in Palestine, and uh, he uh, ran three or four different restaurants over there. And people started bringing in jars and cans and to take home some of his uh, French sauce with. So he finally told his wife, said, well, we just as well get in the business. And it seemed like we're doing something that people want. So he uh, evolved from there and, and um, 
started making the, the uh, Mullins French sauce, as he called it. <laughs> yeah, so something that was really interesting to us is we saw that like you guys are really into French sauce or French dressing. That's one of your big products. But you also have something called imitation French. So there's the two different kinds of French. Can you tell us about how that sort of came about? Well, uh, Mr. Mullen's French sauce, as he called it, uh, went along for several years. But then the FDA stepped in and said, uh, oh, well, it looks like a, a French dressing. And so you, you, but you don't have enough oil in it to be a French dressing. Uh, to be a regular French dressing, it has to be at least 35% oil or fat. And his only had about 19% or a little more than half. And they said, well, you can't call it a French sauce and you have to call it a French dressing since it looks like a French dressing. And he said, well, it, it's good on other things. It's, uh, so it's not just a, on good on salads. It's good in it's a marinade and other things too. And they said, well, it doesn't matter. It looks, it looks like a, French dressing, but it doesn't have enough oil in it, so you have to use the word imitation. So it's an imitation French dressing. That's, that is Mr. Mullen's original salad dressing that he made. And so then they, they tried at that point to make a regular French dressing that had the necessary amount of oil in it, but yet, yet tastes as much like the imitation French as possible. And so that's why there's, there's two different ones now. And the imitation French is still our biggest seller by far. But it and our French dressing are our two main ones. We we make a total of six different uh, dressings and sauces. So, like, the French and the imitation French is really just a matter of uh, vegetable oil? Well, we use strictly corn oil. Gotcha. All of our, uh, I mean, both our dressings, uh, the imitation French and the French, use the same exact ingredients, just a little different proportions of it. Right. What it, uh, what it says on our label here is, uh, for the imitation French, the ingredients are apple cider vinegar, cane sugar, corn oil, prepared mustard, paprika, salt, and spices. Mm-hmm. And the uh, the French dressing has the same thing on it. They're, they're just uh, the corn oil is listed first, and then the apple cider vinegar. So same ingredients, just just different proportions. So if the issue is really just like the FDA was coming down on you guys because the proportions weren't in regulation, why sort of divide between the original recipe and then a new recipe that's just different proportionally? Did you guys consider actually just redoing the French recipe that you already had? He did, but it, it was. It was his favorite, and it was one he really liked. And and I and I say it, it's still our number one seller by far because it it has a little bit more bite to it than the uh, French dressing because it, the, the imitation French has a little more apple cider vinegar in it, uh, which gives it a little bit more bite. So, yeah, at, at the time they looked into uh, oh trying to call it an original recipe or something along those lines, but they said no, uh, you can't do that. You got to keep it an imitation French dressing. This would have been back in nineteen about nineteen sixty or sixty one. Oh, okay. Uh, and I, in fact, I still have a letter here, uh, even <laughs> later on, uh, that they uh, or we tried to uh, call it something different, and they said no, nope, can't do that. Wow. So you don't think that like the word imitation affected the business at all? It's if it's your best seller, it seems like it's um, the regulation. Oh, it absolutely has. It absolutely has because I do several taste tests, uh, different food shows, and. People come through here and want to taste it, and I'll explain to the difference uh, what it is. And I say, well, would you like to try the imitation French or the French? Oh, give me the real stuff. Right. You know, even though the imitation French has less fat in it, so it's, it's better for you. But uh, people just have that word imitation in their mind. And so, yeah, over the years, yeah, it's, it's hurt us quite a bit, I'm sure. Right. Uh, so are you aware of the like the movement for like deregulating the French dressing? Actually, I wasn't until you, you called last week and, and asked me about it. So I looked it up and I thought, well, gee, they're just about uh, 60 years too late. <laughs> <laughs> so what impact do you think that would actually have on Mullins? Because you're already sort of circumventing the FDA regulations and it sounds like, you know, you're able to carry on with the regulated and the unregulated types of French dressing you have. So if they were to deregulate French dressing, would that actually have an impact on you? It probably wouldn't at this point. You know, if they had never done that, I think with, I think Mullins would be a lot bigger than what it is now. But that uh, anytime you go into a new market, you know, people see that word imitation. And, well, whenever I see the word imitation crab meat, well, what does that mean? Is it crab? Right. No. <laughs> it's a cheaper fish. Or imitation cheese. Is that uh, dairy cheese? No. It's not got nothing to do with uh, real cheese. Uh, whereas our, our French dressing, I mean, you looked at, or you, you heard me in, uh, say some of the ingredients there a while ago. Well, heavens, that's all pure fruit. You know, we have no artificial coloring. We have no artificial preservatives in it. Just 
just natural food, but uh, we have to call that imitation. So, yeah, that's been a problem for forever. Or yeah. Longer than I've been involved with it anyway. Well, would you um, change the name if it is deregulated? Probably not at this point because it, people have been used to the word imitation French uh, mm-hmm. for almost 60 years now. Yeah. Uh, so I think I think it would probably just confuse people if, if we tried to do that. <laughs> yeah. Our dressings sell side by side on the shelf and... Some people, you know, prefer the imitation French, and some people prefer the French, and and some can't tell the difference. Can I ask really quickly why you guys just went and called it imitation French anyway? Was that just like the J.D. Mullen decision from a long time ago? Like, why did you just stay with the French dressing name when it had to be imitation anyway? Well, what else would you call it? They said that you couldn't call it a French sauce because it looked like a French dressing, so you had to call it a French dressing. But no, wait a minute, you can't call it a French dressing. you got to call it an imitation French dressing. But the imitation French, uh, we have a lot of good recipes. We have a little recipe booklet. Uh, you can get it on our website, which is, uh, I should mention, www.mullensdressing.com and some other information about our about our company. But uh, it's we've been in business here on, on Main Street in Palestine for uh, over 70 years. Wow. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Okay. Well, it's interesting to talk to you. First podcast I've ever been involved with. So. <laughs> have a great day now. Jeff seems like mostly not bothered by this whole regulation, deregulation business, which, you know, that's good for him. Yeah. Uh, I'm also seeing a pattern here. Now that I'm looking at the name, different names for French dressing, uh, we found a couple companies that clearly make a French dressing but aren't calling it that. Uh, For example, there's this pizza chain in Illinois called Monocles. They have this dressing that they make for dipping pizza in and uh, using on salad called sweet and tart dressings. Yeah. When was the last time you went to Monocle's Pizza? Haven't you been longing for a crisp, fresh salad with our sweet and tart dressing drizzled over it? It's so red and like blood. Oh, my God. But (laughs) it has all those same ingredients as French dressing, like tomato, paprika, and people even call it French dressing. Like on Twitter, people will say like Monocle's French dressing. Yeah. Um, even though it's not, it's called sweet and tart dressing. Yeah. Like everyone thinks of it as French dressing. Um, and then we went to Atkins Farm in Massachusetts, remember, and you bought that the Dahlia onion summer tomato dressing, which was also clearly French dressing. Yeah. Yeah. It was uh, had all the same ingredients. And the one I think about a lot is actually Kraft the original French commercial dressing. Kraft French, the clinging, creamy, thick Kraft dressing that's a favorite with more people in more families than any other kind. Lively, but never too sharp or spicy. They still have a French dressing you can buy in the stores, but their French dressing now is so different from when they made it back then. It used to be called Kraft Miracle French dressing. And if you look at the ads, it's like this clear reddish tint dressing very similar to Catalina dressing. Oh. Catalina dressing. Pour a little of this spicy tomato we thick dressing in a skillet. Now is the time to get both. Kraft French and Catalina. Catalina dressing, also invented by Kraft. They made that name up. Uh, and I've gone on some forums. <laughs> okay. And tons of people are saying they miss the old miracle French dressing that they used to have growing up. And then there are people responding saying... Go buy Kraft Catalina dressing. Tastes exactly the same. Oh, that's funny. My theory is that even Kraft was affected by this regulation. Wow. And they had to rename their Miracle French dressing to Catalina French to fit with it. That's really funny. I tried to reach out to Kraft. They were a little curious, but they ended up declining and giving us no statement. (laughs) Classic. So I guess we'll see how that deregulation goes and if we see more new style French dressings in stores or salad places. I hope we see some like really innovative French dressings or if we just go to Just Salad or like uh, Sweet Green, any of those salad like those chic places. <laughs> Sound chic. Or just even going to restaurants and having that be an option. Yeah. It never is. But the most important part of our research here. Yeah. To understand the vital components of French dressing is to actually be French dressing. We haven't gotten to that part yet. We will work on that. The other part that's important is to make some French dressing. Yes. You're right, you're right. What's the point of even having the mystical book of salads if we're not even going to use one of its recipes? So let's go do that.
Okay, we are in my kitchen now. Yes. And we have the book of salads open here. To the French dressing of... Yes, yeah, so there's, there's five bases here. So we're going to go with French dressing base number five. That was the, like, most pure base, right? Yeah, base five is more of the um, traditional French dressing we know today. You know, the ketchup and the paprika and all that. So um, I'll just read it here. It says, French dressing base number five. For all dressings where cream is used as part of garnish. I guess, you know, French dressing is a little creamier today. Mm -hmm. One fifth teaspoon of mustard dry, one fifth teaspoon of paprika, one fourth teaspoon of salt, one half teaspoon of tomato ketchup, one fourth teaspoon of sugar, one tablespoon of vinegar, five tablespoons of olive oil. Uh, so th that's what the French dressing base number five consists of. So basically like there's a whole bunch of different dressing recipes that yes. use these different bases. So we chose one that seemed uncomplicated. <laughs> we chose one that was more traditional to the yeah. traditional French dressing, which is called Newport dressing. Um, so we add uh, to base number five, which I just read, we add two tablespoons of chili sauce to that. And then that is the Newport style. Yeah, that's it. So we're gonna do the Newport style dressing tonight. All right, so let's get going. All right. So what I got for mustard, I got some Grey Poupon. Um, it says it calls for dry mustard, but uh, I didn't have any of that. <laughs> so we just have wet mustard. Yeah, so we're gonna make do with that. That's fine, right? Yeah, I think it's fine. This is like our, our personal version. Yeah. This is the all would you look at the time French dressing. It's our variation of Newport, but it's our own correct unique version. It's yeah. inspired by Newport in the book of salads. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna use a little bit of Dijon mustard gray poupon, uh, and that calls for one fifth teaspoon. So I put the mustard in this bowl that I have. Uh, it's like a half coconut. I was gonna say it looks like a coconut. <laughs> yeah, I just thought it would sound the best uh, in this. Is it actually half of a coconut? Uh, I don't know. Okay, so next we need one fifth teaspoon of paprika. So what I have for paprika, I got from Fairway, which is a really great grocery store in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, organic smoked paprika. I've used a couple times uh, mm -hmm. while cooking. Uh, so I'm gonna use that. I think that's a great, great one to use. Oh my God, it actually smells really good. Yeah, it does. Next is one fourth teaspoon of salt. Yeah, so I have the San Francisco Salt Company Premium Sea Salt Hawaiian Lava Sea Salt. So um, uh, if you look at the bag, it's black. The sea salt. Yeah. Yeah, the salt is black. I like using because uh, when you usually add it to food, it kind of makes it a little more gray, darker color. Oh. Uh, it's just kind of fun. You like <laughs> gray? Yeah. So let's add that to the bowl. Okay, what is next? We have one half teaspoon of tomato ketchup. My ketchup of choice, um, I have a lot to choose from because I had a ketchup party a couple months ago. So I have uh, probably 20 ketchups in my <laughs> fridge. The one I chose is Sir Kensington's classic ketchup. I thought this was the most tomatoey, like the most authentic tomatoey taste, mm -hmm. uh, kind of like a pasta sauce way. The thing is, I liked the ketchup that didn't taste like ketchup, so I'm not a good judge. Yeah, well, I'm gonna use this one. Um, I need one half teaspoon of ketchup. Next thing we need, one fourth teaspoon of sugar. I just got some regular Domino sugar here. That'll do the trick. Um, anything else is fine. And then we move on to the tablespoon of vinegar. Okay, um, I'm dreading eating this. <laughs> so I'm using some red wine vinegar. Uh, there's no sp uh, specific vinegar it's telling you to use. I always use uh, red wine vinegar when I use, when I make salad dressing. Uh, so I'm gonna go with that. Cool. Thank you. 
and of course the olive oil so got some extra virgin olive oil here and we're gonna add five tablespoons of that to the bowl wow five yeah so that's the main part of the, yeah. of the dressing right uh, all right one two three four all right, now that we got everything for the base, uh, let's kind of mix it together, huh? Yeah. So I got this nice wooden spoon. I thought that would sound good against this coconut bowl. <laughs> I feel like we're on an island. <laughs> I love the smell of olive oil. This is not very attractive looking, but it's okay. Okay, so it's all emulsified in this bowl. And now we're going to add the ingredient to make it Newport style, which is the chili paste. Yeah, which we just bought. What do we get? So I got a uh, Thai kitchen roasted red chili paste. Uh, I thought that looked really good. We just bought it today in the grocery store. Let's use that. For Newport dressing, to French dressing base number one, two, three, or five, we're using five, add two tablespoons of chili sauce. It's a lot of chili paste. Yeah, it's only one tablespoon. We need two. Yeah. All right, and now we're gonna stir all that chili paste in our bowl, and then it'll be all good for our salad. Mm -hmm. it smells good. I want to describe what uh, the consistency is here. Um, it's not super thick yet. I mean, we're still trying to distribute this chili paste, I think, but it's solidifying a little bit more. The whole thing is this really, really, I mean, it's more brown than red. It's like a dark reddish brown. Um, it's solidifying a little bit, but we're going for the, uh, the more liquid version of French dressing anyway. Right. So it shouldn't get too dense. It's really about mixing that chili paste in here because that thing needs to sort of dissolve a bit. It's a little orangey red. It's hard to tell from this brown bowl. So I think what I'm gonna do is gonna put it in a mason jar and we can shake it up. Okay. It's not a lot here, but I think it's all mixed pretty good now. It's interesting that it didn't tell us how much dressing the recipe was supposed to make. Yeah, this is just for one salad, I think. Very All right, small let's go get our salad and we'll pour the dressing on. All right, we got this nice leafy salad here. Gonna add some croutons. And let's add that dressing. It's pretty moist here. Uh, should we add more lettuce, I think? Oh, more lettuce? Yeah, maybe. It's actually a lot more dressing than I thought there would be. Yeah, it didn't look like that much. And there's still a little left in the jar, too. So. so this French dressing is not like reddish orange. It's really brown, huh? It's a little, it's like reddish brown, though. Or maybe I'm wanting to see the red. But the ketchup you used was kind of dark. All right, I think that's good. I'll get a fork. Let's try this stuff out. It does not taste like any dressing I've ever had. All right, let me try. I really like it. I like it too. I like it more than any French dressing I've ever actually had. Yeah. It doesn't really taste like French dressing to me. 
Right. Because the chili paste. The chili paste, obviously, mm -hmm. the most of the ingredients. The mustard. You can taste the mustard in there. This is really good. Because mm -hmm. um, we use that good wet mustard. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of Wor Worcester sauce, to be honest. Yeah. Even if someone had this today, they wouldn't be like, oh, this tastes like French dressing. Mm -hmm. But if they had it back then in the 50s, of course it would be called French dressing. Well, I learned a lot about French dressing in particular. Uh, this was an amazing journey. We learned a lot about food regulations. Yeah. Which I'm is going to happen for you at some point. I'm really glad everyone stuck around to listen. We'll upload the French dressing recipe online and you can check it out. Um, other than that, I think we're going to sign off here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to finish the salad.